Welcome everybody to our session on productionizing ML workloads using Amazon uh, SageMaker MLOps uh, services. Uh, I'm Usman Anwar, Principal Product Manager for MLOps services on SageMaker, here with two of my amazing colleagues. Shelby Eigenrode, I am a ML Specialist Solutions Architect, and I specialize in the area of MLOps. And I'm uh, Greg Kerrin, I'm Head of Data Science at NatWest Group. Yeah. Thanks. Awesome, thanks guys. Alrighty, so we have a pretty packed agenda for you today, so we'll dive right in. We'll talk about the what and the why of MLOps, going over some of uh, the use cases that are priority for our customers. We're then gonna get into what SageMaker offers to support those use cases and the various improvements we have made over the last one year. As we go through, I'll also mention some of the feedback we have gotten, how we're responding to it. Then Shelby's gonna give us a demo on how to use these services end-to-end -to, -end to achieve a use case and talk about how you can approach scaling MLOps within your organization. And then finally, Greg is gonna tell us about his journey at scale on, uh, about his journey on scaling MLOps at NatWest. So MLOps has many different meanings. Uh, broadly speaking, we uh, uh, refer to it as the process of continuously delivering high performance ML models at scale. It consists of multiple activities that take place across the entire machine learning lifecycle. So these are activities concerning development of machine learning models, con activities concerning productionization of machine learning models, and then activities concerning maintenance of an ML system in production on an ongoing basis. So this is a pretty broad uh, area. And MLOps is not just, a, what we've learned, is it's, it's not just one capability that you can just enable. It's a living and breathing discipline that continuously evolves. It's practiced by different personas who work in, independently and together uh, across the machine learning lifecycle. They do so by following specific processes and mechanisms and best practices, and they need purpose-built tools uh, in order to do that. So our goal on SageMaker is to offer these tools out of the box. And the way we measure our success is how these tools help our customers be more agile, deliver more quality uh, models at greater scale, and remain cost effective as they scale. Now, before I get into the nitty gritties of our, our tools, I wanna to talk about the use cases that we see in the wild. Broadly speaking, we can classify use cases into the development side of the life cycle and the production or deployment side of the life cycle. And this is just one mental model. Like you can, different customers have different approaches. This is just one we'll discuss today. Uh, on the development side, we see a lot of customers interested in making it easy to provision environments for their data scientists to help them get started quickly. We see them uh, standardizing how they perform experiments. On the deployment side, we see ML engineers developing uh, pipelines that can help retrain the models in production. We see them packaging and testing the models. Uh, and then they want, when they deploy the models, they want to be able to monitor them on a continuous basis. And then a lot of our customers want to close the loop. So take the uh, results from the monitoring system and use that to retrain the models on an ongoing basis. And also like track end-to-end -end lineage of the model so they can reproduce it to debug the models that they have in production. MLOps offers the broadest set of services to support, uh, SageMaker, sorry, offers broadest uh, set of services to support MLOps natively. We offer SageMaker projects to help you create templates that can help data scientists provision the, resource they, the resources they need to get started. We offer SageMaker experiments to help you centrally track experiments performed on SageMaker. We offer model registry, which is a centralized uh, catalog for all of your models that you can use to version control the models, review models for production, track their lineage, and configure them for deployment. We offer various deployment mechanisms so you can shadow test and very recently A-B test your models. We also offer integrations with your CI-CD systems. So once you want to put model into production, your existing CI-CD systems such as Jenkins pipelines, et cetera, can go launch the model on SageMaker Inference. We offer model monitoring so you can continuously monitor the health of your model. And finally, we offer SageMaker Pipelines, which is a built-in uh, workflow orchestration service to help you uh, retrain the model on an ongoing basis. Now, we've been on this journey for a couple of years. We have built these tools uh, out over a number of years, and they've been adopted by a lot, uh, several customers who are now starting to report a lot of great impact that they're seeing. We see customers tell us that they're 
time to market from initial idea to first production version of the model has decreased by four times. They see 85% reusability of artifacts across multiple teams and multiple use cases. And as a result of that, they report a reduction of overhead in the, in, uh, for their machine learning engineers and data scientists, which just makes their job more exciting. Because instead of doing ops, they can do more data science and more testing. An important use case for our customers, and oftentimes this is where they start, is standardizing the resource creation process through templates. Customers really like to create templates that they can expose to their data scientists via SageMaker projects inside of Studio. When a template is executed, it can go create GitHub repos in the background, it can create pipelines, sample notebooks, uh, model registry, et cetera, everything that a data scientist needs to get started. And guess what? They don't even know the complexity that's taking place in the background. Customers tell us this massively reduces overhead both for their admins in charge of onboarding new data science projects and for the data scientists themselves. We have a growing list of templates available on our library on GitHub, which can help you provision uh, resources for a whole bunch of different use cases from uh, provisioning GitHub, uh, repos using Terraform, uh, provisioning supporting AWS infrastructure such as encrypted buckets or uh, resources for a multi-account workflow. And there are more coming. Once the data scientist has their resources, they start to do iterative experimentation. With SageMaker experiments, you can automatically log experiment metrics and artifacts uh, on SageMaker. Now, customers have given us a lot of feedback here. They don't only want to track experiments conducted on the SageMaker training platform. They also want to conduct, uh, track experiments uh, conducted in local notebooks or in scripts that might be running on on-premises servers. They want us to simplify the concepts in, in the service so they're more digestible by data scientists. They want us to uh, uh, make it easy to visualize and compare and share these experiments. They want better integration with hyperparameter Optimi uh, optimization offerings that we have. They want visualization specific to their use case, such as the parallel coordinate chart that can help you see the combination of parameters that reduces the loss for your, for your model. And finally, they want a simplified handoff between the data scientist and the MLE by the ways of model registry. So a general piece of feedback we have gotten is we need to tightly integrate all of these services so the end-to-end -end workflow is smoother. And this, is some, uh, and this is an area you can expect a lot of updates from us. Now, once uh, the model has been developed, oftentimes the MLE starts to create a, a pipeline that they can use to uh, retrain that model against production data and uh, on an ongoing basis. We see a lot of momentum with SageMaker pipelines. Amongst our enterprise customers, SageMaker pipelines can automate the entire model building process from data processing to feature extraction to model training to model validation and model registration. Customers tell us what well, leading reason for them to standardize on SageMaker pipelines is the built-in fault tolerance. So we have made additional investments in our uh, error handling strategy, our caching, and resilience that all add up to that. Uh, and also, they notice that SageMaker Pipelines is completely serverless, so you don't have to worry about maintaining uh, a pipeline product yourself. And finally, it's free, which you know always helps. We have made four significant improvements to SageMaker Pipelines over the last few months, specifically to help customers iterate faster and minimize their costs. First, customers told us that it is a bit of a pain to test the pipeline end-to-end -end when they're first getting started. If you test the pipeline in the, code, in, in the cloud, it actually goes and creates all the SageMaker jobs that can actually incur some time and cost. So we launched SageMaker uh, Pipeline's local mode that can help, that allows you to run the entire pipeline on your local machine. Uh, in local mode, uh, the pipeline would create local jobs for, so we support all the main jobs, such as data processing, uh, uh, training of the model, and also batch transforms. Once you uh, are satisfied with the inputs and outputs of your pipelines, you can make a few tweaks to them, uh, such as add references to production data or, or uh, add a model registration step that applies to workflows that operate in the cloud. You can then upload this pipeline 
And when you run this, now it would actually execute all the jobs in the cloud, and you also get the advantage of all the other tools in the cloud, such as uh, being able to track the execution of the pipeline in, uh, in SageMaker experiments. Next, uh, we're seeing a surge in use of AutoML by a lot of customers to accelerate their machine learning. SageMaker offers Autopilot, which uses the best-in-class uh, uh, AutoML framework, such as AutoGluon, to automatically train multiple models for your use case to find the best one. Now, using AutoML in production uh, was a complicated task. Customers had to create custom steps in their pipelines, almost four steps comprising of Lambda functions, callbacks, they would have to mo start the autopilot job, monitor it when it finishes, grab the artifact, send it down the pipeline. So we wanted to simplify all of this. So today we launched uh, the AutoML training step in pipeline, which simplifies, boils that down to a few lines of code. So we're very excited with what customers do with it. It's one of the most highly requested features for AutoML that helps take AutoML to production. Next. Customers tell us, well, all of this automation is great, but they got to be able to adapt it to their very complex enterprise environments. A lot of our customers uh, do machine learning across multiple AWS accounts. So they might have one account where the data scientists develop the models, and another where the model is tested or retrained for production and hosted in production. Now, if you want to automate your machine learning lifecycle, you got to automate across these accounts. So uh, we launched support for cross-account sharing of pipelines that can help customers uh, without having to log into a different AWS account, view all the pipelines that are available, and execute them remotely. So you can think about a data scientist who does not have access to production data or like production account. They can simply go discover the pipelines. They can uh, put their model code on a, on a GitHub repo. The pipeline, when it executes in the production account, can take that code, retrain the model, uh, do some testing, send the results back to the data scientist. Uh, again, uh, enterprise customers super excited about this, helps them take uh, LML Ops to the next level. Finally, uh, one of the resounding pieces of feedback we've gotten uh, also, not only for our UI, but also for our SDK is simplification. So we have shipped more than half a dozen simplifications to the Python SDK. Here's just one example where we took two separate steps to register a model and create model artifacts, boil it down to one step. So now it's just easy to add that final registration and creation step into your pipelines. Now, earlier I had mentioned how uh, a lot of customers want to use model monitoring to automate the retraining of the model. SageMaker Model Monitor offers built-in tools to visualize your model's performance and get reports on them on an ongoing basis. It supports um, uh, monitoring for data quality, model quality, model bias, model explainability. <coughs> A lot of our customers uh, over the last few years have use cases where they're using batch inference uh, in mission-critical scenarios to get uh, inferences on a, on, on a bunch of transactions. You can imagine a bank that wants to track down uh, uh, money laundering, for instance. They want to be able to consolidate transactions from multiple systems and then run a batch inference every, every 24 hours to find patterns uh, that might in indicate money laundering. Now, from that uh, example, you can infer, uh, no pun intended there, that uh, this would be a mission-critical model. If, if the performance starts to diverge, it can create more noise, it can create more work for you than it solves. So we launched uh, model monitor support for batch inference. Uh, it's super simple to set up. Uh, you, can, you may have already have batch transform jobs set up. You can go and create a batch monitoring job, uh, set it on a specific schedule. As part of the startup process, you can create a baseline using a training data set and then uh, uh, put it into production. Uh, based on the schedule, the job would execute. It would analyze the outputs to any ground truth that you might have or the baseline, report all of those violations. In a report, you can read through the user interface, but also output it uh, so that it can be programmatically queried. Uh, so yeah, and now uh, I'm going to invite uh, Shelby back on stage so she can show you how some of these uh, uh, improvements can be used together to enable a retraining use case. Thanks. All right. Thank you, Usman. 
And thank you everyone for coming out to the far Mandalay Bay for the session. Sorry, just logging into the computer. I'm gonna swap over. <coughs> All right, so in this demo, I'm gonna show you how to create SageMaker pipelines that automate the tasks that are required to monitor data drift, essentially, for your batch use cases. And there's a lot of different scenarios for batch inference. One, maybe you are actually retraining your model at the same time or at the same frequency that you're performing batch inference. On the other hand, and this is a use case we see quite a bit, and the one that I'm gonna focus on in the demo today, is the one where you're retraining your model less frequently than you're actually performing batch inference. So for our use case, or the demo today, we're gonna assume that we are retraining our model once a month based on new data or maybe signals of drift. And then we're actually gonna be performing batch inference daily. So in this particular use case, we're really looking at two different pipelines. In our first pipeline, we're gonna use that pipeline to train and baseline the model. So we're gonna do the typical steps. Here we're gonna do the good old customer churn example where we're predicting whether or not a customer will churn. So just a simple model, but we're gonna perform the standard model build of preparing data, training the model, and then doing model evaluation. And then if that model is performing according to the objective metric that we've identified, in this case it's gonna be accuracy, then we're gonna go ahead and baseline that model. So in this particular demo, we're gonna focus on data quality model monitoring. So what we're gonna do here is we'll baseline the training data. So we'll perform some statistical analysis of that training data that we'll then use in the second pipeline to compare against and be able to indicate signals of data drift. Then we'll package our model for deployment and register our model. The second, or the second pipeline that we'll go through is for batch inference and model monitoring. So this will be that daily pipeline that runs that performs your batch scoring. So that being said, let's go ahead and get started. One thing to note, I'm gonna skip some of the model build steps, um, one for the sake of time, but also because we have a lot of assets out there that kind of clearly go through those, a lot of different examples. And don't worry, you'll have access to this particular set of notebooks after the session so you can see the full code and dive in. So we'll go through some of the initial setup that some of you may already be used to. We're gonna import some SageMaker libraries to configure the jobs that we'll run as part of our steps in our pipeline. We're also going to import some of the libraries that allow us to specifically configure our SageMaker pipeline steps. Then if we scroll down a little bit, you'll see we're just setting up variables that have S3 paths to the inputs, outputs, and artifacts that we'll create within our pipeline. And here we're gonna set the model registry name. So we're gonna identify the model package group that we're gonna register this model version to for this particular use case. So each new model version will register to this model package group. We're also going to enable step caching. So we're gonna set up our step caching configuration. So one of the native capabilities with pipelines is the ability to cache steps which is really helpful because Pipelines is gonna automatically look at that step, see if that step's been run before with the same input parameters, and if it has, it's gonna automatically propagate those results to the next step without having to recompute that task. So it's really helpful, say you're tuning hyperparameters, and you don't necessarily need to change your data transformations or that data preparation step, but you wanna to continue to iterate and train your, or tune your hyperparameters. With pipelines um, caching, it's going to automatically detect that that was run, so you don't have to rerun that step, which not only saves in time, but also cost as well. So here we're also going to set up a runtime parameter. So pipelines also allows the ability for parameterization. So what parameterization allows for is the ability to pass in a parameter at runtime without having to change your pipeline code. So you'll see here, we're gonna set up the parameter for the raw input data. So this is the batch prediction request data coming in. And since that is gonna change with every time we retrain the model, this is a great example of pulling out for parameterization. Because that way we can pass in a new value for each pipeline execution without having to change our pipeline code. So let's jump into the configuration. Again, I'm not gonna spend too much time on these steps because we have a lot of examples there and we don't have enough time, honestly. Uh, but here we're just essentially doing the normal task for preparing data using processing jobs. We're training the model using training jobs. We're then evaluating that model using processing jobs. But I am gonna skip forward into the steps that are specific for model monitoring. So with model monitoring, like I mentioned, we're in this particular example, we're showing you the data quality model monitor. 
So we're going to configure a step. Again, it's a built-in step. It's the quality check step. So what that's going to do is essentially spin up a job within your pipeline. And this is using a SageMaker managed container. You don't have to create it or manage it. Um, it spins up that job. And it's a managed image. It's SageMaker model monitor analyzer. And what that does is essentially take the input data that you pass it, in this case our training data, it's going to perform some statistical analysis on that data, and then generate baseline constraints and statistics. And these are important because these are what's going to be used for that daily inference, right, to compare against and detect signals of data drift. So to configure this, similar to most pipeline, you configure the job and then you configure the step. So here we're actually configuring the, the config for the check job. You'll see we're just specifying the compute environment for that processing job. We're also indicating the input data set that we're going to baseline, which is our training data set, which is our, the, from the previous data preparation step. Then we're also specifying the output. This is where we want that statistics and constraints file to go. Then we configure the step. So here we're configuring the quality check step using that previous configuration. Then we'll move on and just configure the steps to package and create them, or package and register the model. And this is basically just packaging it to create a model for batch transform in our second pipeline, and then of course registering that model version that we'll use in our second pipeline to determine if that, or to get the latest approved model. And again, I'm kind of skipping those steps as well, because if we went through it all, it would take forever. Um, but next step, we're, we're going to configure that conditional step. And this is also a pretty standard step. It's a built-in step that allows you to apply conditional logic. So in this case, we're going to check for the condition of whether our, met our, whether our model is actually performing according to the minimum threshold that we've identified, in this case, accuracy. So to set this up, we basically just define the condition. This is greater than or equal to. The value, you can see this is a really uh, low value. You might want to up the game on your own. Um, and then we configure the step. So this is the conditional step, which says if it is above that minimum threshold that we've identified, go ahead and execute the remaining steps in the pipeline. So now that we've configured all the steps, we basically want to put all those steps together into a pipeline. So to do that, we define the pipeline, we create the pipeline, and then we start the pipeline. So this is showing where we're creating the pipeline. We list all the steps that we previously configured that we want to run as part of our pipeline. SageMaker is going to automatically infer order based on dependencies, so you don't have to specify order. We're also going to specify any parameters. See, the, these are the runtime parameters that we're passing in with each pipeline run. Then we're going to create the pipeline, which is an upsert. We'll either create or update, depending if you have a pipeline that exists with that name. And then we're going to start the pipeline. And this is where you would specify any of your runtime parameters. In this case, we're just running it with the default value. So all of that was allowing us to programmatically create the pipeline. If we go and look inside Studio, under Pipelines, we'll see the visualization of that pipeline that we just created. So here you'll see the pipeline. Let me kind of, it's probably super small for everybody. So this is the pipeline that we just created. So we can run this programmatically with automated triggers. You can run it directly from inside Studio. And then a cool thing to point out, if, for those that are not familiar with pipelines, if you click on a particular step within your pipeline. The nice part is we will automatically log all of this metadata. So all of the input metadata, so how was this model created, will automatically log outputs from this particular step, as well as logs for debugging and just seeing what's going on within the step, and then step-specific information as well. Now, if we go back, you're probably interested in that constraints in statistics file, right? So our pipeline completed, the baseline actually completed as well. So let's take a look at some of that data that is created as part of the baseline. Again, that output is stored in S3, so just gonna load up that constraints file from S3 into a data frame. And you'll see here, this is the constraints file, so it's automatically, for each feature on input, it's detecting and um, inferring certain aspects of that. So completeness, like this is magically complete, right? You see a lot of 100% there. Um, as well as, you know, is it positive values, negative values on input? You'll also get a statistics file. So this, again, for each feature that's on input is doing some statistical analysis to come up with the, like, things like the min, max, mean, whatever is applicable to the feature on input. So that being said, these two files is what's going to be used against um, to detect signals of data drift during that daily pipeline run that's performing your batch scoring. So let's go ahead and move on into that. 
So in this second notebook here, this is where we're focusing on that batch inference and model monitoring pipeline, which is gonna run every day. So this pipeline will start with our batch prediction input data. Um, we'll also note the model package group that we want to use to pull the latest registered approved model from. And then we will go ahead through the pipeline, get the latest approved model, we'll run the monitoring job, then we'll run the batch transform job. And the output of this particular pipeline is gonna be our prediction output data, but also our monitoring output. And that's gonna be in the form of monitoring reports stored in S3, as well as events emitted through logs in CloudWatch. So let's run through this one. Again, some initial setup, importing the libraries that we need to create the pipeline. Here we're also specifying two key outputs. Those are your batch transform results in S3, as well as your monitoring reports that'll go in S3. The first step is we're just gonna configure a Lambda step. And what's nice about pipelines, it does include a native step for Lambda. And this is great for applying or incorporating any custom logic or custom tax, tasks within your pipeline. So we're just gonna have a simple Python function that simply goes and gets the latest approved model from the model registry. That's gonna be used in our later steps to actually run the inference as well as the model monitoring. So what that Lambda step is gonna do, it's gonna get the latest approved model and then collect metadata from the model registry that's used for those later steps in the pipeline. So this is just our Lambda function, simple Python code. And then we're gonna configure that Lambda step. So to configure the Lambda step, there's just a built-in helper function where we're pointing to the code for that Lambda function. And then we're specifying the outputs. In this case, this is the metadata that we need for the later steps within our pipeline. And then we're configuring our Lambda step. So this is a built-in step where we just specify the function as well as that model package name from the model registry where we're pulling that latest approved model version. So that being said, we'll move on to our next steps, which is actually to configure the batch transform job that performs batch inference, as well as the model monitoring job. And it's one single step within pipelines. So the monitor batch transform step is a single step that actually spawns out two parallel processes or processes that can execute in the order that you define. And those are a processing job, once again, with that managed container image that is going to run monitoring against the statistics and constraints baseline that you created in your model training pipeline. And then it's also gonna have, of course, the batch transformation job as well. And to do that, just similar to every step, you go ahead and configure the step, or, or configure the jobs and then configure the step. So here we're just indicating where our prediction data is. This is data that we've specifically loaded with some violations. Um, and inside here, we're passing in another parameter. So because, again, this pipeline input data is going to change every day with your pipeline, you can pass this in as a parameter. So first step is to configure your batch transform job. If you're familiar with batch transform jobs in SageMaker, this should look familiar. The second one is to actually configure the check job. So this is actually the monitoring job itself, where you're essentially specifying that input data. So this is the batch input data. And then you're also specifying the location that you want that monitoring report to go to. And then you just configure the step. So it's a single step that you configure that's gonna spawn those two processes essentially. And using that configuration that you previously defined. A couple things to point out. It is the same container that's used between your baselining as well as the monitoring. You just tell it to act in different ways. So here what we're saying is um, monitor before batch transform. This is a monitoring job, it's not a baselining job. Um, so we're saying here we want that monitoring to run before you run the batch transform job. You can also fail on violation. I have it set to false mainly just to show the pipeline, um, but it's something you'd probably wanna consider, right? So that if you are seeing signals of data drift, you fail your pipeline instead of going and proceeding into that next step for on your batch transform. Then once again, we're putting it all together, same exact steps again. This is a you know, one-time creation. Of course, you can update that pipeline. And then we start the pipeline execution. And we'll just take a quick look at this pipeline. It's a really simple pipeline. Uh, it has the Lambda step, has the monitoring, and then the batch transform job. So three simple steps can run on a repeated daily basis. <laughs> and if we go back and look, like I said, we did kind of load this one up with some violations. So what happened during that pipeline run when we had that processing job, those are two outputs, right? The monitoring violations report 
as well as the CloudWatch logs that get emitted from that. So let's take a look at both of those. This is the constraints violations report. Just gonna load it up into a data frame from S3. And you can see we found four violations. So we have four features on input that are looking different than our baseline data. Previously within our baseline, it was 100% complete. Now you're seeing you know, 92% to 98% complete. So in this case, it did finish with violations. And you can modify these constraints depending on your business data and what's acceptable to your use case. The other thing to point out, and this is typically interesting to MLEs or DevOps teams, is that it does emit data to cloud event, cloud watch logs. Um, and inside there, you'll, if you query the logs, you'll see completed with violations for the monitoring job. And this is just kind of showing that. This will only occur in the case where there are violations. So why this is important is you can essentially use this log data to create a metric, create an alarm that you can then notify the team on, you can stop the pipeline, whatever makes sense for your use case. Which kind of brings us into the next part here in terms of handling monitoring violations. A couple things, and we always recommend automating the exception handling, right? So automate those logs and the alerts when there are violations detected. What you do with those may depend. It may require manual intervention from a data scientist to look at it, see if it's within acceptable ranges before you go ahead and do the batch transform. But you could also automate it with your retraining pipelines too, right? If there are violations detected, you have ground truth data to retrain on, you can go ahead and then trigger your retraining pipeline. So that being said, we went through a lot. We focused primarily on automation and model monitoring here. We could continue to evolve this and mature this to incorporate things like continuous integration, source control, version control, and continue to mature these pipelines. Which brings us into our next topic, which is really about scaling ML ops. And we'll kind of introduce a framework here. So we're gonna quickly look at a typical journey that we see customers take when they're incorporating ML ops into their technology practices. So we look at the journey in four stages of adoption, from initial all the way to scalable. And as you move across those different stages, you see increased operational efficiencies as your MLOps maturity grows. And let's take a look at some of the deeper capabilities within each stage, starting with the initial stage, where we're really focusing on how do we implement some standardization around our tooling? How do we make sure data scientists have access to the resources that they need? like compute, like data, by standardizing our experimentation environments, as well as starting to standardize a mechanism for experiment tracking. Then we move into the repeatable level where we're really focused on automation a bit more. So how do we remove some of those ad, ad hoc aspects that we see in the initial phase when we're just moving out of proof of concept and we're kind of moving into more of the repeatable stage where we're not only interested in reducing our time to POC, but we're also interested in reducing our model deployment time as well. So this is where we see a lot of automation come in in terms of automating your model build, your model deploy pipelines, automating access to resources and data science environments for your data scientists that automatically include all the best practices around governance, security, the things data scientists do not want to worry about. So all of that is essentially automated. And we also see here starting to standardize on source code repositories, good practices with source code control, and then centralized management of models done through SageMaker model registry. Then we move a little bit into the reliable stage, and this is where we see customers starting to incorporate full CI CD practices like the source and version control, consistently used within pipelines that are automatically triggered, also implementing quality gates, implementing model monitoring, and then into the scalable phase where we really start to see the standardization of templates that are not only used within a single team but across the organization. So here we're really focusing on reducing that entire machine learning development lifecycle time. Now this is just high level. You may be looking at that thinking, you know, I have certain practices that span different parts of the, the journey, which is completely typical. And this is just a typical pattern that we kind of see, and it's a high level view of that journey that we often see with customers. But the point is, it really is a journey. And as you look to increase your operational efficiencies through MLOps, just kind of keep that in mind, right? It takes some time to get all of that stuff incorporated. 
And speaking of that, I'm going to now turn it over to Greg, who is going to tell us about his MLOps journey at NatWest. Thank, thank you, Shelby. You are welcome. Good. Hi, everyone. So uh, how many of you have um, ever worked in an organization where it takes too long to get something done? <laughs> yeah, everyone. How many of you have struggled to get your data science and ML workloads adopted across the enterprise? Hey, OK, yes. But you're not alone, OK? We, 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 we were there. Uh, and what I'd like to do over the next uh, 20 minutes is really give you a flavor of where we've come uh, in our data science journey with NatWest Group, what we've built with, with AWS, and how that's let us um, deliver an MLOps solution that's you know, secure, scalable, and sustainable across the, the enterprise. And ultimately, that's really letting us getting, get more value from our data uh, more quickly. So for those of you who, are not, who don't know, NatWest Group is uh, one of the UK's leading uh, business and commercial banks. Uh, we we um, have customers of, I think, one in four uh, businesses across the UK uh, are with us you know, from startups to multinationals. We have a large retail organization, and together we have about 19 million customers um, that we support to, you know, and, and to, to thrive. Um, we have a, a growing community of about 500 data scientists and engineers across the, uh, the organization, and they're all you know, passionate about trying to use the, the, the large data asset that we're collecting on our, on our customers to really make a genuine impact to, the, to their lives. Many of the brands in the, in the group uh, have, have histories dating back two or even 300 years, and that's a, that's a legacy that we'll, we'll come back to touch on um, in a minute. But over that time, the, you know, the, the bank has created you know, thousands of different models, rules-based system, systems that cover all aspects of what we do, from you know, capital allocation to fraud detection to you know, de delivering prompts in the mobile app. And for me as a data scientist, that's a fantastic opportunity to, to, to work within and to change. And we're really trying to ch change uh, how, we how we deliver uh, value from that data using ML operations. I think as, as, as you have in many large uh, organizations, a lot of the challenges that we faced uh, you know, before ML operations can be placed into these, these categories, four categories, so people, process, data, and technology. So we have a lot of talented people in the organization, but they've not historically had the right training support to, to, work, to work, with, work with cloud and to work in a, this software development mindset. Secondly, on process, we've, you know, we've grown over, over organically over time, and that leads to many you know, legacy processes that get in the way of innovation and time to value. I've seen so many cases of data scientists working in one system writing code and models, who then hand over to engineers in another system, who then implement that in production. And that just leads to you know, um, uh, frustration on all, on all sides. Data is often siloed, uh, difficult to discover and access. And our technology state was often fragmented, out of date, and frankly, not very attractive to work with for the next generation of staff we're looking to recruit. So, so with these challenges fresh in our mind, we, we then focused on building out our MLOps vision. And these are focused on, I guess, four main themes that are tied together with that faster time to value. So the first one is really, how do we standardize on, on patterns for the, the, the management, the creation of, of infrastructure, and the, the management of, of models and, and the pipelines that support them? Second, how do we use MLOps to challenge the existing governance processes and come up with simplified uh, procedures that uh, let us go faster? Third, how do we break down those silos and, and simplify that data access across, uh, across different teams in the enterprise. And then finally, how do we create a modern tech stack that's supported by a federated op operating model that gives power and autonomy to the data science teams themselves to self-serve the, their infrastructure and have ownership of the, the end-to-end -end solution? And as I said, the, the, really the, 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 key vision, the key point here is how do we go faster? How do we deliver value from our data more quickly to get those insights on our customers um, um, more quickly? So what we've done, what we've done with, uh, um, uh, with the AWS over the past couple of years is really uh, realize this, this vision of, of ML operations. So what we've done is right from the start of that engagement, we were uh, laser focused on a set of metrics that we wanted to use to really uh, articulate the story of where we were and where we wanted to go to. So that these metrics were really focused on, on that time to value and how do we go faster to deliver end-to-end -end solutions 
uh, to simplify data access, to get things live, and, and, and to allow the self-service creation of, of environments quickly. Typically, as, you know, as, as, a, as a data scientist, when, when, I, when I joined the bank four years ago, it, it, we were in a really, very much in that left-hand corner of this, this maturity scale that you see here. Um, when I joined, it, was, it could take you weeks to get even the most basic Python environment up and running. And that was only after talking to 10 different teams or looking at you know, 10 different wiki pages. And that was before even looking at any data. So it was really a, a, a big struggle to get you know, access to data, to build some models, and then to try and get them you know, into production uh, to, to get that insight. What we've now done is, is really work with AWS to, to build uh, our um, ML operations environment centered around SageMaker. And that now allows teams to, you know, we're now training deep, deep learner models on multi-GPU architectures in the cloud and getting those solutions live into production in a matter of months. And that, that, that was something that just wasn't possible within the group even 12 months ago. So what we've done is, uh, what I want to do now is just, just talk you through roughly what our, our SageMaker um, architecture looks like. And it really all, all starts with what we call our, our shared service account. So here we've got a centralized account that's owned by our, a central platform team that hosts common resources artifacts uh, that, that we use across all the different use cases in the enterprise. So for example, we have common uh, Docker images that underpin the SageMaker pipeline steps that Shelby spoke about. These are stored in, in ECR. We've got um, uh, shared uh, and pre-approved infrastructure products that sit within service catalog and, and other artifacts that are related to model um, pipelines and their promotion through into production. How it then works is that, that a, a team will uh, then uh, create the, um, a request via ServiceNow to that central platform team to provision uh, three accounts that, that they then use for their infrastructure development, testing, and production. And those all, ha all have secure connections to our enterprise data lake that ties everything together. Once those accounts have been provisioned, the, the, the team itself can then self-service via uh, service catalog the provision of user roles, SageMaker Studio domain, and, and other products into those accounts so that the teams themselves can start working uh, on, on the, the, the use case. At that point, there's no, there's no connection back to the, 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 platform, the central platform team, and the, the, the team itself is, is really self-sufficient at, at that point. The names of the accounts, development, testing, and production, relate back to how they're used in the data science uh, lifecycle. So in development, you'll obviously have data scientists and engineers uh, using notebooks, starting to develop uh, data analysis, data wrangling, start to build their first models and start to build the first pipelines for training and for inference. The uh, testing account then mirrors what you have in production and is used for obviously testing your different, um, uh, your different inference workloads before you then promote them through into production. Once the, the data science team starts uh, to, to work and you, and you build some models that you're, that you're happy with, we then have another role called model approver that comes into play. They can then look via the studio interface to understand uh, different metrics related to your model. Is it performing to, to your business requirements? They can check things for data bias and explainability. And once happy, they can then promote those models and pipelines through into the test and production account. And that's via a few clicks in the, in the console. Okay. That, and that then gives, gives us the ability to have these, these inference pipelines in a production environment. And what's really crucial for us is that, that is, uh, you know, until we had this system, Every use case, every team had to create their own route to live um, in a very bespoke way, going through architecture boards, uh, design forums, and it just led to that duplication of effort, but also a lack of standardization. And now with this system, we can we easily, with, for each use case, we then have that route to live built in from, from day one. And that, just, that allows the, the teams themselves to simply focus on solving the business challenge and not having to worry about um, all these different um, components and how, and how to manage that infrastructure. For me, one of the, the key things, one of the, the real power points for, of, of uh, SageMaker is it now gives us also that standardization for data teams to really um, yeah, focus on, on the business challenge. And it gives them a, a common language that they can use to talk to each other about how to create those production pipelines. 
So when, now when I dive into conversations with different teams, I hear them talking about training jobs, processing jobs, model registry, experiment tracking, and we now have that common language that really helps teams across the bank support each other with, and, and, and share that knowledge and ultimately lets us go faster as an organization to build these, uh, these workloads. One of the challenges that, the, that we quickly faced once we'd launched this platform was the, the fact that we, we had a, sen, a, a small number of centrally managed uh, Docker images that support those um, SageMaker pipeline steps. And we found that, that that quickly became unfeasible because all the different teams we were working with had a, a whole bunch of different requirements for, for their uh, data science workloads. So we quickly engineered a, a system to let teams come with their own, uh, with their, sort of bring your own mindset for, for the Docker images. So from within that, that development account, a data scientist or engineer can use a code build project to then build their own uh, Docker image, which they can then push to ECR in that shared service account. And that then makes that available for any, anyone on the platform to then use in, in, their, in their workload, whether it's in their model training step, or it's in some inference step or a processing job, they can then, they can then use that. And it has the inbuilt dependencies for that particular, that particular use case. And that just gives teams the flexibility to then control um, how they want to develop. As you, as you heard from, from Shelby, a key, a key component of this is, is the you know, SageMaker pipelines, and then within Studio, the concept of, of SageMaker uh, Studio projects. Again, when I initially approached this, I was concerned that this, uh, this structure would be overly constraining to teams and would limit how they could, how they could create and, and solve problems for our, our own customers. However, what I found is it's actually that, that structure that it brings is, is liberating and really helps teams focus only on solving you know, the real business problem and, and, and lets them, they can then rely upon the structure that comes with pipelines to, to ensure that they have the guard rate need for, um, to be compliant with what we, we do as a bank. One of the things that we noticed within SageMaker Studio, out the box, you have a lot of you know, pre-built pipelines and projects that you can rely upon, but we found that with our you know, working as a, um, as a heavily regulated FS firm in the UK, we have a lot of additional compliance steps that we have to be, um, uh, we have to be, com be compliant with to do with you know, data checking, bias, monitoring, uh, uh, explainability. And one of the advantages of, of using SageMaker pipelines is that the, the teams themselves could then quickly adapt and modify the, the, these, these templates to, to their own needs, such that we had all these inbuilt steps. This was done once, once by, um, this, this was done once and then made available to everyone on the platform to then uh, rely upon for their, own, uh, for their own use cases. And we're now, yeah, we're now continuing to expand this list of custom pipelines to include additional frameworks and processing steps that we need to meet our, meet our needs. When, once, the, the, once the platform was, was launched uh, this year, we quickly moved into a mode where we tried to uh, focus more on, on the adoption and engagement of the platform across, across the enterprise. We didn't just want to focus on a few high-performing teams to use this, but we wanted to get adoption um, across all aspects of, of how we operate. So we focused on a few things. First one, we trained hundreds of data scientists and engineers uh, in how to use AWS services. Second, we, we established um, a well-resourced uh, enablement squad that really embedded themselves with all the different use case teams to get their um, projects onto the platform and, and educate users how to, uh, how to work with it, but also to gather continuous feedback about the, the platform we created and use that to, uh, to make future improvements. We were really clear about having sort of visible metrics within that process to ensure that we could continually track and report uh, and how that adoption and engagement was going so we could have that conversation with our stakeholders to really ensure we could celebrate our successes and also understand where the problems were, were going to lie. And then we, we really sort of reached far and wide across the organization, uh, you know, not just focusing on traditional data and analytics teams, but looking at teams in, in fraud, finance, audit, uh, cl climate, to get them on board and to identify user champions within those groups to, to really advocate for the use of the, of the platform. So just, just to try and bring this to life a bit more, 
one of the, one of the things that we had noticed you know, before we launched this, this platform was just to get started for, for a team would typically take you 40 or 50 days just to have, uh, have an environment in which you could look at some data. Okay? So if you had, had an idea in NatWest you know, last year, you had something on a whiteboard and you wanted to build a solution, just to have you know, some very basic SageMaker environment up and running could easily take 40 or 50 days. Okay? So that just leads to that delay to, to value and that delay to innovation. Since we've launched this, this, uh, this platform, we've drastically reduced that, that time down to one or two, or two days. Okay? So that, that automatically helps get, getting, getting things up and running. Then within that, once you have those baseline accounts uh, from the, that, are, that are created, teams then have the ability to self-serve the, the creation of their SageMaker Studio domain and other products uh, within that. And that can be done in a matter of one or two hours in, in this case. Whereas before, that could easily take the central platform team up to a week to, to bes you know, create that bespoke environment for, for each individual. So again, this, this really just helps us get more value from our, our, our teams and our data more quickly. So since we've, since we've launched uh, in about six months ago, we now have 13 teams uh, across the bank on this platform. Over 30 use cases are now uh, building and developing ML solutions on that. We've got hundreds of projects and pipelines up and running. Ten, you know, thousands, tens of thousands of, of processing jobs, and we've now trained over a thousand models in our development environments. So this is just going to continually help us adjust and, and uh, move uh, move the dial in terms of how we get ML adopted across uh, NatWest. One, one of the use cases that we've recently uh, uh, put, put live on this platform is what we call customer conversational intelligence. So for many years, the bank has had chatbots, has had telephony centers that, uh, that our customers use to, to interact with us for you know, access to services and, and, and to, get, to get that support. We found that a lot of that data that links to those conversations was sitting you know, in, in a, a database, not being used. There was no insight being generated from that to help with things like optimizing and personalizing customer journeys. There was nothing there to help with customer self-service support. And there was no insight to help our operations teams optimize and improve their own, um, their own efficiency. So w with, with this platform we've, we've built on SageMaker, we then created two new uh, ML models that look at those, those conversations, both uh, the, the web chat from our, our chatbot and also the, the, the voice transcripts that come from our telephony centers. So we have around 100,000 conversations a day within the bank. And we now built, we built two models, one using BERT Topic and another one using Fast Text Classifier to, to do two different things. One was to do a, um, create a, a reason for the conversation to help us understand why the customer was contacting us. And the second was to look at the, the resolution status of the conversation. So was the conversation resolved? Was it dropped? Was it deferred to an, another agent? And these insights, we can then provide those back to the business units to help them with that optimization of the customer journeys. OK, so just a, a, few, a few key takeaways from today. I think the first thing is really, you know, don't forget about the hearts and minds in this process. When we, when we started this at NatWest, we, we realized it was a major transformational change to the organization that we were going through. So, so the vision that we created for ML operations had to be, you know, had to be compelling and, and business-led. And the adoption and, and engagement had to be, um, you know, uh, had to be excellent for the, for the community. We had to make sure that we could build for complexity. So, you know, data scientists and engineers are a smart bunch. So we had to make sure that we could consider that kind of bring your own mindset, both for uh, Docker images, for, for, for uh, pipeline templates. I think also MLOps, is, it's a journey, okay? So you have to be flexible in, in what, what you do here. You have to get that continual feedback from your customer. You know, deliver value quickly, but respond quickly to their, to their feedback and make sure that you can then build what, what you need for your own enterprise. Okay. The operating model that you have has to be uh, uh, thought through quite carefully. That, I think that was a mistake that we made in, initially. We didn't think too much about the operating model, but that has something we've now sort of retrofitted uh, in, in, into the platform. And I think for us, that federation really helps putting the power back into those, those teams that sit across uh, the, the business to give them the opportunity to, to work, uh, to, to work uh, in, that, in that federated and self-serve way. And then finally, as with any large organization that's grown over time, 
typically you'll have a lot of legacy tech that sits there. So whatever you build, you should really make sure it can integrate with those other data sources or, or other systems that you use uh, in, your, in, in your enterprise, either on cloud or on premise. So in terms of the, you know, where, where, are, where are we now, uh, so we've definitely moved significantly up this, this, uh, this curve that you saw from, from Shelby. Really now we're at the point where we're, project delivery could easily be taking you know, 12 months plus uh, from before. We're now really rapidly getting to the point where we're uh, delivering projects with ML at the core in less than three months. The data access piece is uh, significantly shorter. You can do that within a day. And, and really that, that self-service creation of those environments, uh, which could before have taken many weeks, can now be done in a matter of, of a few hours. So that, that this really helps us move much more uh, up that curve towards that scalable phase, and really helps us get much more value from our, our data uh, much more quickly, and ultimately helps us with support those 90 million customers that I mentioned at the start. So thank you. Sorry, I, I, I realized that it's been inspired. That's <laughs> fine, I'm just, I'm going to hear what you say. thanks, Greg. That was fantastic. All right, everybody, so that.